Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 21st Annual Community Health Symposium, A Journey Towards Health Equity. Um, my name is Edo Igadaro, and I'm a first year, med first year medical student. And I just wanted to first start this off by thank thanking everyone here today. The fact that you're taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here today shows your dedication and commitment to community health and community health research. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here. Um, next, for our um, physicians in the room, I just wanted to point out that this is an event um, that you guys can receive ACCME credit for. So if you would like to receive your credit, you can go ahead and scan the QR code on the screen. And I'll just wait a minute for you guys to go ahead and do that. Okay. So next, I think it would be really important for us to first acknowledge the land that we're hosting this event on. Um, so the, we recognize that Stanford sits on the ancestral lands of the Milwaukee Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people consistent with our values of community and inclusion. We have a responsibility to acknowledge and honor and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. So with that said, I'm just going to go ahead and do a quick run through of today's events. Um, so after I'm done welcoming you all, we're going to be welcomed by Dr. Maldonado, and she will be introducing our poster presenters. Um, next, we will have the amazing Dr. Rosas to introduce you all to our wonderful keynote speakers, Dr. Aiton and Dr. Ross from the California, California Endowment. Next, we will have a quick Q&A followed by a quick five-minute break. And then we will have Dr. Chen come up and welcome us to our panel speakers. After that, we will close the event by um, doing a quick award ceremony. And then we will have some closing remarks from the lovely Dr. Faciato. So with that said, we'll go ahead and get started. So it is my pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Maldonado. Dr. Maldonado is a professor and chief uh, and the Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases in the Department of Pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine. She also has shown a commitment to perinatal HIV infection prevention and treatment in the U.S. and internationally. So with everyone, so could everyone please help me welcome her up onto the stage. Welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to see you all here in this room. I remember last year, Lisa and Magli and everyone else, we were sitting over on Page Mill Road, the people who could find it. And now my lab is over there, so I know it well. Um, but also to be here on this beautiful spring day um, where we're all together and feeling so much more, I think, optimistic maybe than a year ago. At least I do. So I'm hoping that you all feel a little bit of that as well. So I really want to thank all of you, especially those of you from the community who aren't directly involved at Stanford, um, for coming out at, here and joining us in this really important opportunity. So um, I have not had the pleasure of being to all 21, uh, 20 of the previous events. But I can tell you that the last few years where I've been able to come to the event, it has just really been a really um, inspiring opportunity and really, I think, helps us understand more about what our community needs are and how we can best interact with all of our communities here at Stanford and beyond. So I want you all to take this opportunity today to really build some relationships with other people here that you know or others that you might not know that we hope you can get to know. Uh, I'm going to go a little off topic with the, <laughs> my introduction because I um, really think that a lot of us, in fact, I would say all of us, have suffered trauma from all of the events of the last three years and before that. But for sure, the last three years with COVID-19 and all of the events transpiring after the murder of George Floyd, all of that has led us to a collective trauma that I think we really need to start to address in a really serious way now that we, I think we have a little more support and resources to do. And one of the things, the only, one of the few things that came out of all of these um, traumatic days was the fact that we learned that we needed to build our communities more strongly. 
So the communities here, the communities globally, um, really communities that we didn't know we needed to touch bases with, that we needed to build and nurture. And I don't want us to lose that because we're out of the pandemic or that we think we're starting to address in a very microscopic way all of the injustices and the, and, and the racism and the institutional issues that plague our, our country and our world. So let's be positive about this. Let's try to focus on how we can continue to build these community relationships so that we can start to tear away one by one at all of the inequities and the disparities that we see in our world today. Because I know everyone in this room can contribute to that. And one of the things we did learn from the pandemic and all of the more of the awareness that we saw in this country is that all of us have that power. And to get if we bring if we build that power together, we can do a really good job in laying a foundation for our communities that exist today and the communities of the future. Um, so, um, so that said, um, I just wanted to come back to the talking points I wanted to make around the symposium, because I think the symposium really plays a critical role in highlighting the achievements of our Stanford medicine community and our valued partners in addressing some of these health disparities. And I think we can always do a better job. Um, so we do strive to do a better job. And Dr. Golden Rosas, who will speak later, um, really does um, have this as her sole mission, her academic and, and um, life mission has been really to build our community so that we can do a better job of reducing health disparities and making human health possible. So I'd also like to thank uh, Edo Igodara as well as Ada Zhang, who have done a really amazing job. I just got to talk to her a little bit, and we're both Hopkins alums, so we were both talking about how much we both love Baltimore. Um, as, as our medical student coordinators for this symposium, so let's give them both a hand for what they've done. This is no easy feat. Um, they've been working with two departments, so that's the Office of Community Health and um, the Health Equity Action Leadership, or HEAL Network, through my Office of Faculty Development and Diversity in the Dean's Office. And we've once again collaborated to plan today's session. So I also appreciate the hard work led by Glenda Estioko and the planning team in putting together this important event. And I especially would like to thank the sponsors that are listed in your program for their important contributions. And in the Office of Community Health and the Office of Community Engagement and the HEAL um, initiative, we continue to lead efforts such as this event to promote health equity through partnerships, research, mentorship, education, and public health initiatives. Fittingly, the theme of today's symposium is a journey towards health equity. And again, notice we're saying towards and not in. We are trying to get to the first stages so that we can build that out even further. I, I noticed that when we talk about health equity uh, globally, m everyone embraces that concept, but we don't really understand what it means yet. I was on a call this morning with CDC trying to build a research plan to un analyze some national data around uh, uh, health equity impacts on COVID and really trying to get to the point where we understand not only what health equity is at a global level, but understanding what it means at a, at a daily level. How do we really get it to the point where we know how to solve day-to-day -day problems for day-to-day -day people? That's something that we really aspire to, and we need all of your input to try to understand that. So, so many of our faculty, postdocs, students, and clinicians do dedicate their research, care, and outreach to communities that are disproportionately impacted by systemic racism, poverty, access to essential services, and other social determinants of health. But we're just scratching the surface. We're just starting. And we need to understand not only what these disparities are, what social determinants of health are, but how really to effectively address them. And that's going to be a long pathway. But I think we can all do it together. So today, you'll have the opportunity to learn about some really amazing examples of partnerships that are successfully addressing some of the disparities affecting our local and our global communities. And I hope you are inspired, as I always am, by the wonderful and impactful work shared by our speakers that will result, we hope, in significant improvements in understanding health equity and in understanding how to try to address it. So um, to begin our program, I guess I will, uh, I'll introduce our uh, poster speakers, correct?
Great. So thank you so much for being here, and I look forward to a wonderful session today. So we're going to start off with our poster presentations. And the first one uh, will be Improving Mental Health Competence, presented by Margarita Ramirez Silva. Hello, everyone. Can you, can you all hear me? Yes. Beautiful. I'm, I'm mildly technologically challenged, but um, anyway. <laughs> my name is Margarita Ramirez Silva, and I will be talking to you today about my project, Improving Mental Health Competence at Life Moves. So I can't even start to talk about my project without talking first about my amazing, wonderful, spectacular community partner, Life Moves, which is one of the largest shelter networks in all of Silicon Valley, operating around 26 shelters and a plethora of programs throughout the um, Mid Peninsula. Um, so, Life Moves has um, has does have a barrier when working with clients in that. A lot of the times it's very difficult to work with patients or, and clients who have uh, psychiatric and behavioral health disorders. Um, the leadership acknowledges that this is partially due to stigma and lack of um, understanding of psychiatric and behavioral health disorders on part of the, uh, the staff at the shelters, uh, but they also wanted to explore other contributing factors. This then le leads us to the purpose of the project, which was first to explore barriers to successful client encounters with mental health. And the results from that then led us to the second portion of this, which was to improve staff knowledge of psychiatric disorders and skills for addressing emergent and non-emergent psychiatric situations. So as far as methods, uh, there were two parts of this. The first part was exploring barriers to successful client encounters, and this was done via two semi-structured focus groups where we asked uh, staff at the shelters, one, what barriers exist to supporting clients with mental illnesses at Life Moves, and how do these barriers impact their ability to uh, support clients with mental illnesses? The second part was uh, really, what well, my favorite part was uh, co-creating a training to improve competence. Um, and in order to assess improvement, we did a 13 question uh, pre and post training survey where questions one through eight assessed knowledge of different psychiatric disorders and questions nine through 13 assessed confidence and skills such as assessing for suicidal and homicidal ideation and also uh, grounding techniques for panic attacks. So this leads us to part one, the results of the focus groups. So here I present to you the three main themes that I found. These were the three main barriers. First was access to care. And in this, I think one of the most representative quotes was the fact that when a case manager finally finds, you know, or the, the client finally decides, yeah, I could use some help, um, they're like, okay, perfect, let's make you an appointment. Uh, the appointment isn't until two months from now. So then that person either is moving around or loses interest. The second part was staff knowledge. There was a lot of hesitancy, especially around patients who have uh, certain disorders such as schizophrenia because people don't know how to, how to engage with this person and don't understand what it's like to reason with someone with this disorder. And lastly, we had client perception. A lot of clients are simply not willing to see a therapist or a psychiatrist because they're like, I'm not crazy. Why would I go see this person? Um, and from this, the Life Moves leadership really decided that they want to focus on the staff knowledge piece just because they thought it was the most pressing and the most actionable. And because of that, we created uh, some trainings. So we created something called a Psych and Behavioral Health First Aid Training, which is based on the Mental Health First Aid Training done by the National Council for Mental Wellbeing, whose goal is to make mental health first aid as common as CPR training. Uh, and you might be wondering why not just have the staff, you know, like take this program. Well, the program is eight hours long and not everyone has that time. Um, and in addition to that, Life Moves One, it's something that was specific for um, people at shelters and the homeless population. 
And you might be wondering, like, well, why? Because the homeless population has some very specific needs. As you can see here, um, many of them suffer from mental health disorders. And also, shelter staff are often tasked with deciding, uh, making these very difficult decisions of, like, is this person screaming because they're just being unruly? Or are they screaming because they have, they're having a psychotic episode or a panic attack or any of these things? And what they actually need is medical intervention. And what they had actually found was that oftentimes there were some staff who would kick someone out of the shelter when in fact what they needed was medical help. So because of this, we created the Psych and Behavioral Health First Aid Training. Um, and by the end, the, some of the goals of the training was to be able to identify symptoms um, and signs of common mental health conditions, which we found in the literature and through the uh, Life Moves experience was the most common. And then also using trauma-informed care principles to assess um, emergency and non-emergency situations, such as uh, panic attacks and suicidal and homicidal ideation. Here on the, what is this, right? Um, I'm, I'm directionally challenged sometimes. Um, we have uh, the, the roadmap of the training. And you can see one was, the part one was very much just giving an introduction to everything. And number two was putting knowledge into practice. So learning skills and also doing cases such as these, which were inspired by things that had happened at Life Moves. Um, where they present a vignette, and then we have, I had, to, I had to be an actress for the day and pretend to be the patient, um, and then the case managers or the, um, the resident coordinator or whoever was at the training had to, you know, act out what they would do in these situations, and we followed this mental health first aid action plan by the mental health first aid um, that's right here on your right. So for the survey results, we found that um, there was a statistically significant improvement in the results of the pre and post test. Um, so that was very exciting to know. <laughs> so this brings us to the conclusion. Um, so the focus groups really highlighted the fact that there is a need for increased access to psychiatric and behavioral health care in these communities, and also to increase education among staff and clients. Um, also, we learned that this training is, you know, seems to be like a good option for these uh, very busy people, and it's at, taught at a level that's very understandable for everyone. Um, and it's also something that we should give to more Life Move staff. I think they have around like 500 or something staff. So give that out to more people and uh, make it a requirement for the onboarding. Not only that, it can be something that can be packaged and given to other organizations that serve the unhoused. Uh, lastly, another other directions that came out of this is that we really want to look at how to improve client knowledge and attitudes around psychiatric and behavioral health care and also create robust referral systems such that someone who, is, who needs help doesn't have to wait two or three months to access the care that they need. So lastly, I wanted to thank uh, Life Moves, especially Philip Da and Robert Smith, who unfortunately couldn't be here, um, for helping with me with this project. They really are amazing. Um, and I also want to take, thank the Valley Fellowship for funding this incredible opportunity and all of you, the audience, you know, for being here and for being champions for uh, health equity. So thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you for that uh, presentation. Our next presentation is from Melvin Fox uh, from the Roots Community Health Center, uh, who will talk about implementing a barbershop-based hypertension treatment model in the community to reduce hypertension health disparities. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Melvin Fox. I'm a research associate and project manager for the Presence 5 for Racial Justice team here at Stanford School of Medicine. Hi, my name is Esteban Lovato, and I am a volunteer at Roots Community Health Center. And under the leadership of Dr. Tim with Diocese, we have the Cutout Retention Program. And so with the Cutout Retention Program, just to provide you all with some background information and knowledge behind the work of what we do, um, black men are disproportionately affected by hypertension and as a result suffer alarmingly high rates of both morbidity and mortality. This disproportionate trend can be difficult to address in traditional healthcare settings, in part due to the mistrust of the medical community due to the historic systemic violence of black bodies by the healthcare system. And so with that cutout retention program, we provide free treatment for hypertension 
in a space that we know that our patients will more than likely return on a continuous basis, but most importantly, they're able to be treated in a space where they feel a sense of community and safety. And so Roots Community Health Center has cultivated a network of barbershop with Roots in East Oakland's African ancestry communities to conduct free blood pressure screenings and provide culturally congruent health coaching by trained barbers while engaging a hypertension specialty pharmacist to address cardiovascular health disparities through health counseling, in-shop screenings, labs, and initiation and monitoring of antihypertensive medications. And so the, the objectives of the cut hypertension program um, is we hope to address uh, this particular disparity through training barbers and cosmetologists to become health educators, navigators, coaches, and community leaders, building trust between health providers in the black community in a sacred space such as the barbershop, where dialogue and thought exchange occurs with a sense of safety. And lastly, empowering our communities to take agency in our own health and wellness through education and access to treatment. How the cut hypertension program works is that we receive referrals from blood pressure screening events held at one of our partnering barbershops or from a local healthcare facility, providing that a person has an elevated blood pressure reading. From that initial screening, we invite the person back to one of our barbershops for an additional reading in order to make a diagnosis. For all qualifying participants that enroll in our program, we pay for their haircut as an incentive for each appointment they commit to. These appointments that, that we have uh, are held with a specialty pharmacist that provides lifestyle counseling and uh, medical medicine management, medication management, sorry. We were supposed to have our poster up, but I can just kind of briefly talk about some of our results. <laughs> um, so our program is in its early pilot period. Um, so we do not have full longitudinal data, however. Um, we did have two patients to show you all that we had one African-American patient who was 30 years old, um, was diagnosed with hypertension and stage three chronic kidney disease and also irritable bowel disease. And so when he initially met us, and um, when he screened into our program, his blood pressure was at 154 over 99. And so after working with him for X amount of months and with the assistance of medication, we were able to help him get his blood pressure down to 117 over 80. In contrast, we um, had another patient who was an 18-year-old and was also diagnosed with hypertension, and he um, also had a family history of hypertension. Um, he was initially screened at 141 over 79, and he was able to get his blood pressure down uh, without medication, but instead with lifestyle changes such as incorporating exercise into his re uh, weekly routine and uh, changing his diet as well. And so, and, and <laughs> And some of the things that we learned along the way is that, one, black barbershops can be places of health promotion and outreach, um, community building, and treatment for the black community. We also learned that incorporating barbers as health coaches into our patient treat treatment plan has significantly helped our patients identify, reduce, or prevent high blood pressure in clients and referred participants. And lastly, we learned that health coaching is most effective when teaching methods are client-centered, strength-based, and collaborative. And so for the future directions of the Cut Our Pretension program, the program itself is looking to establish more partnerships with more barber shops that are located throughout um, East Oakland uh, and San Francisco. Um, also trying to advance its virtual care services as an alternative option for established patients by the spring of 2023. And one aspect of the program is care coordination, where we work to get our program participants to either establish or reconnect with their primary care home for continued treatment. We're currently working to strengthen our partnership with surrounding clinic partners uh, to ensure that there is a warm handoff between our program and their clinical home. And so for our acknowledgements, we would like to thank Roots Community Health Center staff and volunteers for their work throughout their support in the development of this program. Additionally, we would like to thank our partnering barbershops for allowing us into their space to provide care and advocacy for our patients. And this funding for this project was provided to you all by Alameda Alliance for Health, HealthNet, San Francisco General Hospital Foundation, and Stanford Medicine. Thank you so much. Thank you to both Margarita and Melvin for that wonderful presentation. Um, I personally learned a lot throughout um, your guys' presentation, and I'm very happy that you guys were able to take the time and come here today to present to us the work that you guys have done and will continue to be doing in the future. So thank you again, and if you can just all give a round of applause or one more for the both of them. 
And if you liked Margarita's and Melvin's presentation, we have a lot more. If you guys scan this QR code, you guys will be directed to a link with a lot more presentations from students in our community who have done a lot of community health research um, throughout their time here at Stanford. Um, you'll see them um, present the, the research that they've done um, the, in a video, and then also you'll also see their, their poster up there. Um, so this is a great link to go to if you guys are wanting more great community health research. Um, next, I just would love to invite up Dr. Rosas to introduce you all to our wonderful keynote speakers. Great, thanks, Edo, and thank you so much to our student presenters. That was really wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Bonnie, for such a warm welcome um, to our event. Um, so my name is Lisa Goldman Rosas. I'm an assistant professor in the departments of epidemiology and population health and also in our department of medicine and primary care and population health. And one of my favorite jobs is I get to be the faculty director for the Office of Community Engagement that put on this wonderful event. And I don't want to miss a chance to thank all of the organizers, our student organizers, our sponsors, um, my whole team, especially Glenda Estioko. I don't even know where you are um, right now for allowing us to all come together. And like Bonnie said, I really want to thank um, all of our community partners for um, coming here today. I know some of you came from um, far away, and we are so glad that you are here. <clears throat> and then I think I would be remiss if I didn't thank our Clinical and Translational Science Award that supports our Office of Community Engagement and um, this event. So now on to introductions for our keynote speakers. So I am always excited about our keynote speakers and I always feel really lucky, but I feel especially lucky this year, and I do not say that every year, um, to have repeat offenders or returning guests. So both of our keynote speakers are our very first uh, repeat performances that we have ever had. So you know that we really, really like them and treasure their thoughts. Um, they were arguing before about who gets introduced first and whose introduction is more illustrious. So I've been put in a really terrible position, but I am going to try to do justice um, to both of them. <laughs> um, they are both very wonderful. And I already was told by other people to start with uh, Dr. Tony Eiten first, so you are my first introduction. So uh, Dr. Anthony Eiten not only has an MD, not only an MD and an MPH, but he also has a JD. So I think he's really ready uh, for anything. Um, he is the Senior Vice President of Programs and Partnerships at the California Endowment, and as where he has been since 2009. And many of you know the California Endowment is one of our largest private um, health foundations in California, um, and it has been around since 1996. Uh, prior to his time with the endowment, uh, Dr. Eiten served as both the director and the county health officer for Alameda County um, Public Health Department, which is where I first became familiar with him because I was a, um, a graduate student down the road at UC Berkeley at the time. And I remember him seeing him speak in various uh, fora and things like that in public health. And I especially remember his... Um, uh, the Unnatural Causes, a documentary where he was featured talking about um, social determinants of health. And if you haven't seen uh, that documentary and you care about public health uh, and, and health equity, I highly recommend it. It's old now, but um, unfortunately or fortunately, the issues are still the same, but I digress. Um, so at Alameda County, he oversaw the creation of an innovative public health practice designed to eliminate health disparities by tackling root causes of poor health that limit quality of life, lifespan, uh, and lifespan among California's under-resourced and low-income communities. So he has held other roles as well, including as Director of Health and Human Services um, in Stanford, Connecticut, as primary care physician here in San Francisco for the Department of Public Health, and interestingly, as Staff Attorney and Health Policy Analyst for Consumers Union, which I learned um, publishes Consumer Reports. Is that right? Very cool. Um, so finally, if I haven't convinced you of how amazing he is, his academic achievements include uh, neurophysiology, a bachelor's in neurophysiology from McGill University in Canada, um, his JD from UC Berkeley School of Law, and a medical degree also from Johns Hopkins, Bonnie. So you have another alum in the room. 
So we are so excited to have you, Dr. Iden, and can't wait to have you come up. All right, next, I am very pleased to introduce our very distinguished visitor, Dr. Bob Ross. He once asked me to repeat the distinguished visitor part, so I'm just gonna go ahead and say it again. <laughs> Dr. Ross, if you don't know, um, has been our Stanford Haas Center for Public Service distinguished visitor for 2022-2023. We have a distinguished visitor for Haas uh, apparently every year, but never has it fallen so squarely in our field of interest, and we couldn't be more excited that he has been here for this past academic year. Um, and if you haven't gotten a chance to attend one of the events where he shares his experience and, um, and expertise, you are really in for a treat. So Dr. Ross is the President and Chief Executive Officer for the California Endowment. Uh, during his tenure as President and CEO of the California Endowment, he's provided leadership in supporting the vision of underserved or under-resourced communities and grassroots leaders for a healthier California and really a healthier America. The California Endowment has provided advocacy and funding efforts in support of health for all across the state, expanding health coverage for undocumented residents, farm workers, strengthening diversity in the health workforce, advancing wellness-driven school climate reforms, improving health advocacy for young men and young women of color, and providing leadership for health-oriented criminal justice reform. So throughout the endowment's tenure building Healthy Communities campaign, he has supported the engagement and leadership capacity of young people and community residents to fight for improved health and wellness at the community level. More recently, uh, he served as the chair of the Los Angeles County Task Force on Alternatives to Incarceration, developing a strategic roadmap for the county to reform the criminal justice system in support of health-focused strategies to reduce incarceration. Uh, and I happen to know that that initiative and the motivation um, for that amazing work didn't really come from academic papers or research gaps or anything like that, but rather from community engagement efforts that he himself did on the ground. So Dr. Ross has an extensive background in health philanthropy as a public health administrator and as a clinician in previous roles like commissioner um, of the Philadelphia Department of Public Health, medical director of a school-based clinic program in Camden, New Jersey, instructor of clinical medicine, which many of us can identify with at uh, CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and a faculty member at San Diego State University's uh, School of Public Health, and we're so sorry they lost the basketball game. Um, Dr. Ross has been actively involved in community and professional activities at both the local and national level. He served as a member of the President's Advisory Commission, Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans, co-chaired the National Diversity and Philanthropy Coalition, and served as a member of the California Benefit, Health, uh, Benefit Exchange Board, um, among many others. Uh, he was recently honored um, uh, in 2020 by the American Public Health Association with their highest award, um, which I remember. He has undergraduate and master's in public health administration and medical degrees, all from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. In addition to our two amazing speakers, uh, who you're really going to enjoy, we have a wonderful moderator who I am excited to introduce as well. Um, so Dr. Joyce Sackey will serve as our moderator tonight. Dr. Sackey is our inaugural Chief Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Officer for Stanford Medicine. She just assumed that role um, on September 1st of last year. She's a clinical professor of medicine and an associate dean here. Um, and as our inaugural Chief Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Officer, she reports directly to all the big folks, to the dean and to the CEOs of the hospitals. And she works with them to design, develop, and oversee enterprise-wide strategies and efforts to advance uh, inclusive excellence, health equity, and justice. Prior to coming to uh, Stanford, uh, she was Associate Provost and Chief Diversity Officer for Tufts University Health Sciences, where she was also a professor and a dean for multicultural affairs and global health in their medical school. So we are so pleased to have Dr. Saki as well. If you can put your hands together and invite everybody up. Um. Great to see all, all of you here. Uh, by way of context, yeah, I think I was the first invited speaker at um, at, at the uh, Community Health Symposium, whatever year that was, 20, uh, 2001. Um, and I was a brand new uh, president and, uh, and, and foundation uh, chief executive at the, at the foundation, at the California Endowment. Um, 
and so it's a pleasure. Thank you, Lisa, for having me back and having us back. Um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here again. And as um, Stanford's distinguished visitor, um, it's been a blast. It's really been terrific. Um, so context, and I'm going to hand this over to, to, to Tony. Um, context, when I, when I came here for the first symposium, I was a relatively brand new uh, CEO at, 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 at the endowment. Um, and my path and track record was first as a practicing pediatrician in Camden and Philadelphia at the height of the crack cocaine epidemic and simultaneously the HIV AIDS um, outbreak. And so just as the COVID pandemic has, has shaped and influenced career paths it, uh, it, actively now, the crack cocaine and, and HIV um, epidemics shaped my career path because it, it told me that I wanted to move from the practice of, of pediatrics and clinical medicine into the practice of, of public health. Um, and so I wanted to shift from an orientation that had a patient or a family as my unit of intervention as a healer to shifting to a community. Right? Um, and I was being introduced uh, at that time to the social determinants of health, rather rudely, I might say. Right? That led me to a career in, in second, my second career in public health, ran the Philadelphia Health Department for four years, then got recruited to San Diego County to run their um, public health department and later their Health and Human Services Agency, was there for about eight or nine years, and that's when the California Endowment found me. And by the time I got to the California Endowment, I knew I really wanted to focus uh, my leadership attention as a former pediatrician, as an African American in public health, uh, on matters of what we call back then the social determinants of health, now uh, more commonly referred to as health equity. Um, I came to you as a brand new uh, CEO at the foundation. I knew I wanted the foundation to focus on the social determinants of health. It wasn't clear to me when I came to you then what that would look like. Now we know, 20 years later. Um, I may have been the parent of the, you can hear from Tony Eiton, our 10 year, $1.5 billion, 14 site, place based, place conscious, um, building healthy communities campaign that wrapped up uh, a couple of years ago, and I may have been a parent, but the nanny, the person really raising the child on a daily basis was Tony Eight. Right? Uh, it was Tony's leadership and brilliance who really gave some shape um, to the Building Healthy Communities campaign, um, and you're gonna hear from him now about what happened, what did we learn, uh, what's been achieved, and implications for uh, health equity and advancing health equity and wellness across the state. And you're gonna hear about that, that the operative terms you're gonna hear are race, place, and power. And with that, join me in welcoming my friend, my colleague, my hero, Tony Eight. <laughs> Thank you, boss. Um, <laughs> um, I, I want to appreciate uh, you guys all inviting us here today. And you know, I and Bob is the same way. We we tend to like interactive uh, sessions. I I don't like being a talking head at people. Um, so I hope there's an opportunity to have a little bit of back and forth. Um, but before I start, I just want to acknowledge Yvonne Maldonado and her leadership on COVID. Um, these past few years across the entire country. Just an incredible uh, spokesperson, <laughs> leader. Um, sets, really puts, I mean, Stanford doesn't have to be put on the map, but kind of puts Stanford on the map in terms of public health leadership uh, in a crisis. So I just want to acknowledge that wonderful leadership. All right, let's see. I'm, I unfortunately only have a, a short amount of time because I'd like to talk longer on these things, but um, I'm going to talk until somebody actually pulls me off with a hanger. Um, so I want to just offer you some lessons that are dangerous. Um, and these are the three. One of the things you learn in law school is always state your conclusions up front because you never know when you're going to be cut off by a judge or a, you know whatever. And these are false conclusions. These are the things I learned in medical school um, that were really paradigms. And, and the paradigms are misleading paradigms. This notion that health is, a, is about smoking, drinking, driving without a seatbelt, having sex without condoms, 
or that health is really about transactional interactions between you know patient and and sort of this exalted physician in a 15 minute interaction in a cubicle or that um, health is somehow a weird genetic lottery and some people get bad genes some people get good genes and and the goal of the healthcare system is to essentially manage those people who got dealt a bad hand and i want to argue to you that these are all frames that are individual frames but they don't actually explain the major macro health problems that we have in this country. And to explain that, you have to recognize that health is, in fact, political. And when I say political, I say it intentionally with a small p. And one definition of politics is it's the struggle over the allocation of limited and precious social goods. And so communities that don't have power, when the time comes to decide where the grocery store goes, where the park goes, where the sidewalk goes, where the broadband goes, they're much less likely to get an equitable allocation of those health protective resources. And as a consequence, cumulatively and synergistically, they end up on the short end of health protective resources. And so the role uh, for those of us who care about health equity is to get into the power game. And that game is political. I'm not talking about partisan, Democrat, Republican. I'm talking about the ability to participate in decision making, particularly over the allocation of resources. So power matters. It matters at the individual level. It matters at the family level. And it matters at the community level. And that's what Building Healthy Communities recognized very early. OK, so what we're arguing, in essence, is that rather than taking a technocratic approach, we have to think about democratic approaches to health. And that's hard for people at places like Stanford and Johns Hopkins and other places where we're essentially inculcated with this notion of sort of randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, prospective experimental trials as the gold standard for everything. And we, we learn that anything that is potentially political is at risk of being subjective and um, essentially not scientific. And I want to argue that that is so far away from the truth, it's, it's, it's almost crazy. This is health. This is, these folks, in the, particularly the ones in the red hats, they're being motivated by a narrative, a story. A story is running through their minds. And that story is a story of entitlement and dispossession. They feel that they're entitled to the instrumentalities of the US government, and that somehow they've been dispossessed of that control. And that drives some very extraordinary behaviors. I don't know how many of you like to climb things. This is a very difficult thing to do. <laughs> to do this, you got to be motivated. There's something driving you. Think, just think about it yourselves. Have, have you ever done this? I mean, I haven't. So there are these narratives in this country that essentially shape the way we think about who we are. And there's, there are really two of them, two narratives. One is a narrative of exclusion. And that is illustrated by some of those people climbing that wall. And that, this narrative of exclusion basically does three things. It dehumanizes the target of that narrative. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're crack babies, you know, they're super predators. They're not like us. The second thing it does is it exaggerates this notion of scarcity, that we live in a zero-sum world. And whatever they get means that they took it from us. And the third thing that it does is it defines America very narrowly. And it basically looks to the past with this whitewashed kind of gauzy lens and looks to the future with fear. And when you analyze the political narratives that are driving some of the debates today in America, you will see all three of these elements. There's another narrative. It's a competing narrative. It's a narrative of inclusion. At least that's what I call it. It does three things, slightly different things. One of the things it does is it changes the narrator. And this is particularly critical for community engagement. People have to be able to tell their own stories, particularly around health, because it allows them to humanize themselves. It allows us to see our own experiences 
in their stories and to recognize that we are connected. The second thing it does is it broadens the lens to show how our fates are literally inextricably intertwined. And the third thing it does is it talks truthfully about our past, about racism, about genocide, about slavery, about the exclusion of the Chinese, about the incarceration of the Japanese, about the mistreatment of women, about discrimination against LGBTQ. It tells the truth so that we know that we can't go forward the same way that we came that we have to go forward in a different way. And these two narratives are pitted against each other, and they are instrumental in shaping health. And I'll tell you how that matters. But first, I want to tell you about place. This is where I grew up. You heard I grew up in Montreal, Canada. It's a beautiful city uh, with great infrastructure, housing, stock, wonderful parks, and um, outdoor cafes, and great uh, public transportation. Uh, this is a view looking down on McGill University, where I went to school for free. In fact, I got paid to go to McGill. Could have got paid to go to McGill Medical School, too, and I have no idea why I decided not to do that. Um, that's Montreal in the, in the background there in the St. Lawrence River. Canada has a very strong social contract. What's the social contract? I'll tell you in a second. Uh, it's got universal health care, universal dental care, universal child uh, um, care, paid sick leave for all employed people, state-of-the-art public transportation in most of the major cities, and highly subsidized post-secondary education, and great investments in parks and public infrastructure. When you're trying to assess how strong a social contract is in a country, you only need to look for one word, and that word is universal. In order to have universal policies, you need to have political will. In order to have the political will to invest in universal policies, you have to have social solidarity. You have to be able to see other people's fates as being, being inextricably intertwined with your own. And that's what's lacking in the United States. So the question is always, for me, what is the American social contract? And this is what underlies our work in building healthy communities. We know the US doesn't have universal childcare. We know the, universe, the US doesn't have uh, universal paid leave. Despite COVID and everything that we learned about the vulnerability of so many of our, our fellow um, Californians and Americans, and we know, of course, the United States doesn't have universal health care, and we have to ask ourselves why. Why is that? And the answer is, sorry, this is the short version, otherwise I would have asked you. Um, if you don't have social solidarity, you can't create universal policies. And I'll tell you a quick secret. The way to get to social solidarity is to get to it through crisis. The way that Europe got to its strong social contract was being bombed to the close to extinction in World War II. And after that, there were a series of efforts to essentially say, we're all vulnerable, we need to stick together, we need to build our social contract. The message that the US took after World War II is actually quite different. It was that we were invincible and we saved the world. And we went on on a very different path than really the rest of the developed world. So without social solidarity, you get no universal policies. That's the problem. We have a weak social contract in this country, and it's primarily because of our original sin of racism and our inability to see others as ourselves. OK, so Yvonne went to school at, at Hopkins. You recognize some of these scenes. This, this is immediately outside Johns Hopkins Hospital. And when I got to Hopkins, I had no idea what I was looking at. I was like, this looks like a war zone. And I asked myself, rather than growing up in Montreal, Canada, this kid, for all intents and purposes, is me. This kid did not create the environment around Johns Hopkins Hospital any more so than I created the environment in Montreal, Canada. Yet this kid has to navigate these adverse conditions every single day of his life. And this kid is the same basic kid who's trying to navigate conditions in South LA and East Oakland, um, all around Roots Community Health Center, which is a wonderful resource, by the way. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we have kids like this in California up in our, our, our north and our native um, lands uh, with no running water, no electricity in 2023 in California today with young people trying to navigate those conditions. They didn't create those conditions. They don't deserve those conditions. We have fantastic studies that reveal the fact that these conditions are bad for your health. 
Yet we tolerate these conditions every single day because of our politics and because of our narrative. It's not just Baltimore. Uh, I ended up in southern Indiana when Mike Pence was governor and Jerome Adams was the uh, health commissioner. M Pence obviously went on to become the vice president. Jerome became the surgeon general. Um, they had a huge crisis in southern Indiana. This place called Austin, Indiana had the distinction in 2015 of having the world's highest HIV incidence rate, higher than sub-Saharan Africa. In the United States, in Indiana, driven by a drug called Opana that people were essentially grinding up and injecting and sharing needles and very efficiently spreading HIV and hepatitis C. And, and, and Pence had to struggle with needle exchange programs, which is a whole other story. But for all intents and purposes, what I saw in southern Indiana was exactly what I saw in East Baltimore, Maryland. This is the white face of income inequality in the United States. It's the opposite side of the coin of the black face. It's driven by the same forces, by racism. This is collateral damage from racism. Okay, so the question for us in this space became, in the United States, does your zip code matter more than your genetic code? And somebody mentioned uh, unnatural causes. That was one of the themes there. And I just want to quickly show you some of this data because I'm a data nerd and I like to show data. So this is the Bay Area, and you probably recognize San Francisco Circle there. This is Alameda County. And uh, in Alameda County, when I became the health officer there, I became very excited about looking at death. I know, creepy, right? When you're the health officer, you're the registrar of all births and deaths. So there's a certificate. This is a death certificate. And every death certificate tells you what somebody died of, their age when they died, their race, ethnicity, and where they lived. And you can take those four pieces of data and paint a very compelling picture of how death happens in a place. That's what we did in Alameda County. This is Alameda County, every single census tract, where we calculated, on average, how long somebody could expect to live. And we found a 22-year life expectancy difference just across the city of Oakland, between the Oakland Flatlands and the Oakland Hills. And that has nothing to do with behaviors, access to health care, and genes. You cannot explain these patterns based on those paradigms. You can explain these patterns based on political power, very clearly and very easily. And it's not just Alameda County. This ended up on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle. We went around the country replicating this study. And of course, Baltimore, we had to go there. Baltimore has a neighborhood with a life expectancy of 58 years. If I grew up there, I'd be dead, probably, by now. Uh, since it, uh, uh, Cleveland, New York City, Seattle, LA, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Boston, Philadelphia, San Antonio, Denver, uh, uh, I forget what that is, I think that's St. Louis, uh, Chicago, and um, I don't remember what the last city is. Everywhere we looked, and we're still looking, by the way. And, and the longer version of this, I would show you a bunch of Canadian cities. I would show you a bunch of European cities. But this is a short version. Uh, everywhere we looked in the United States, we find these dramatic disparities in life expectancy. And you cannot explain it based on our typical paradigms. And that's the problem, is that we're actually barking up the wrong tree. We've misdiagnosed the problem. The problem is not a technocratic problem. It's a democratic problem. It's the failure of our politics. And to build health equity, we have to re-energize our democracy. And that's what building healthy communities is. And I'm going to tell you about it quickly, and then I'm going to shut up. Um, it's an ecological approach to improving population health. Our theory of change is, and you read this like Hebrew or Chinese, you read from, from, the, from the right to the left on this. So if you want to improve health status, which is our mission at the California Endowment, You've got to improve the conditions that people navigate, like that kid I showed you in East Baltimore. You have to change those fundamental conditions. Those fundamental conditions are essentially risk conditions. And in some communities, health is fundamentally about the balance of risk and opportunity. Some communities are stacked high with risk and really lacking in opportunity. Others are stacked high with opportunity and really have almost no risk. And that's, that's the problem, is that we create conditions very, very intentionally that create meaningful risk for young people throughout California today that have to navigate these conditions. And we know that they are unlikely to be successful. We know it, because we can predict it. 
So it's not like we don't know, it's that we don't care. So you have to change those conditions. To change those conditions, you have to change policy. This is political work, small p political work. You can't do this with services. You can't do this with brochures. You have to change the fundamental rules that shape how resources are allocated. And to change policy, you need power. And that's what our work at the California Endowment is. It's about building social, political, and economic power in a critical mass of people in places so that they can meaningfully engage in decision making and hold institutions like Stanford accountable for equity. Okay, so Bob mentioned 14 communities across the state. We spent actually $1.8 billion because um, we're a little spendthrifty when it comes to justice. We, we feel like, you know, it deserves the money. I'm going to tell you a quick story about Fresno. And some of you may know Fresno, some of you probably don't. Fresno is um, one of the poorest congressional districts in the United States. Um, substantial disparities there, a history of very substantial redlining, just like in Oakland and in, in LA. And I hope most of you know what redlining is. Uh, you can look at the redlining map of, of Fresno and superimpose it on the life expectancy map of Fresno and you see this incredible correlation. And that's no accident. And so in the northern part of Fresno, you've got very nice parks and infrastructure. In the southern part of Fresno, not so much. In the southern part, southern eastern part of Fresno, you've got more Latino, African American, uh, Southeast Asian populations. The northern part of Fresno is wealthier and much whiter. Um, and so we, org we helped uh, community groups in Fresno, in Southeast Fresno, organized. They chose as a priority parks. Um, because the young people were getting hit by cars, they were getting arrested by police, when they were just looking for places to hang out, as young people want to do. We all did. We had safe places to hang out, um, to skateboard, to play baseball, to do whatever it is that young people do these days. I don't know, maybe they all sit on their computers in the park. I have no idea. But they need safe places to do whatever it is that they want to do. And they recognized this, um, and they created a campaign called One Healthy Fresno, one of the first things they did is they went to the Fresno General Plan. The, Fre the General Plan is basically the constitution of the community. It says how resources will be distributed over time. And in the Fresno General Plan, they found out that the parks per capita, acreage of parks per person in Fresno was five times uh, in northern, North Fresno what it was in the southern part of the city. Five times, this is from the city's own uh, general plan. So they thought very wisely, well, we should tell people about this. This is pretty interesting. The general plan actually documents the disparity. So they decided they were going to have a bus campaign and they were going to decorate Fresno City buses uh, with the data that came out of the Fresno general plan. And guess what the city said? No, you can't do that because that's too political. Big mistake, city. So this became a big issue. Uh, it was noted that Fresno is at the very bottom of parks per capita across the United States. Um, a campaign was started about where's the parks? Where's the parks plan? Um, this information uh, was made public through a series of uh, press conferences led by Fresno Building Healthy Communities. It got a lot of press coverage, uh, actually international press coverage. Uh, embarrassed the mayor uh, for what she had decided to do which is to deny them the right to publish on a public space information that comes from the city's own general plan, uh, she ended up being the butt of political cartoons um, around the place, and guess what? She caved. And by the point that she caved, the Fresno Building Healthy Communities folks said, we don't need the bus banners anymore. We got way more advertising on this issue than we could ever have asked for. But they decided they were gonna do more. They organized a political campaign to get on the ballot uh, an initiative to put a quarter cent into, of, of sales tax into parks um, in Fresno. And they ran that campaign, and I'm giving you a short version of this. They lost at first. They got 52% of the vote. That 52% of the vote was a majority. Um, the city said, 
no, this is a tax measure, it needs to get two thirds. Uh, the community said, no, that's only true if you put it on the ballot, but when we put it on the ballot, it only needs a majority. The city said, no, um, we're not going to essentially acknowledge this win, so the Fres Fresno Building Healthy Community sued. They sued, um, and every single major aspect of Fresno's power infrastructure, the mayor, the police chief, the fire chief, the police union, the chamber of commerce, um, the Taxpayers Association joined the suit against the community. And at the appellate court, the city won. And at the Supreme Court, the city lost. And this changed the law for all of California, not just for Fresno. And as a result, Measure P was implemented, and it is projected to bring in about $2.2 billion of revenue for parks in South Fresno. That's equity. This campaign was run by young Latino, many undocumented um, community members in Fresno. They won this. They beat the police chief, the mayor, the, the chamber of commerce. They beat them all because they were organized and they had power and they won $2.2 billion in parks. And they're not done by any stretch of the imagination. This is uh, the lawsuit. This is what it looked like. Um, measure P is one example of about 1,200 examples we have throughout Building Healthy Communities of health equity. Health equity is fundamentally about changing the narrative, the story of us. Who are we? What are our core values? Narrative drives policy. Policy creates conditions. If you want to change conditions, you got to change the policy. But if you want to change the policy, you can't just bring charts with data. You gotta tell a different story about who we are and what we believe in fundamentally. That's what Building Healthy Communities is. Hugely successful and a hell of a lot of fun. I'll just tell you, it's, this is great work. Thank you very much, I uh, appreciate your time. <clears throat> I don't know who I'm giving this to. Thank you so much, Dr. Elton. That was really inspiring, incredible. And Dr. Ross, I am just in awe of all the work you've done. Distinguished visitor, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Distinguished visitor. <laughs> Um, so at this point, we're going to uh, transition to the question and answer phase of, uh, of this incredible afternoon. And so I'm going to invite our speakers, Dr. Ross and Dr. Elton, to come up to the stage. And we have some questions that were presented to us at the time of registration. And we're also going to entertain questions from the audience as well. You want to here or there? I think over there will be... Great, and I don't know if we have enough mics. I can actually give you this mic. Because I'm Thank you. By the, by the way, Joyce, we, Joyce, we just came from a meeting where people were singing your praises, so. Oh, thank you so much. You may not be distinguished, but people like you about it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, while we're waiting for questions, uh, Tony, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set up the first one to you. It's, it's, a, it's a setup, because this was, you know, it's a beautiful presentation, and it's glossy, but it was bumpy. So Tony, can you describe for folks a couple of the early mistakes we made and how bumpy it got? Yeah, uh, so when we were planning this, they said I had 20 minutes and I was like, oh, okay. Well then I can't talk about the mistakes. Um, you know, the, I think the, the, one of the most interesting parts of this work, and I, I come from sort of an academic background and, and, and as does Bob, so we're, we're kind of nerdy. Um, and when you sort of draft out a plan on paper and you think it's beautiful and it's got references and it's got diagrams in it and you're quite sure that you've essentially solved the world's greatest riddle and then you take it out into community and you share it with them and you get humble really fast, really fast um, because community is really expert in sort of what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. 
And so we had grand designs that we, for instance, I mean, we have this list of 10 big mistakes that we made. Uh, probably the biggest one was the assumption that we could bring what I call the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker together to make a meal. You know, that we would bring community members, institutional leaders, uh, community-based organizations and organizers together around a big table. This was the plan. A uh, big table and staff it for a decade where we would feed people, we would bring them, you know, tr transport them, we would have child care, um, and they would all get along and they would solve all the problems in the community. And of course, you ignore the fact that there are some real deep grievances that exist in communities. Um, you know, you got the sheriff there, and you've got a, a guy whose brother is locked up for 25 years. He thinks unjustly. And he's looking at the sheriff and saying, that SOB locked up my brother. I'll be damned if I'm going to sit here and take anything he says seriously. You know, you've got the, the school chief there, and you've got young parents and, you know, who may have brothers or sisters who were expelled from the school. And they're like, glaring down at the, at, the, at the school superintendent. So quickly, some of those kind of plans unraveled, unraveled very quickly. Um, and we had to respond. Uh, I think a great example, which Bob tells well, I should probably let you tell it, is the, is the um, our agenda was sort of a little bit more of a traditional health agenda. What we thought we would do in schools was really around school food, around physical activity, around um, um, you know, reproductive education, around, um, you know, uh, health career pipelines. But um, quickly, our communities told us, you know, you're missing the big issue, which is the school-to-prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. And we said to ourselves, you know what, that sounds kind of like an education thing. That doesn't seem like a health thing. So, like, no thank you. And our com young people just kept pressing us on this. They pressed our board. We went to had a board meeting, and young people stood up at that board meeting and said, you're missing the biggest issue. And finally, we got our act together, and we started looking at some of the data. 800,000 kids suspended and expelled from California schools every year in 2010. That's more kids than graduated. And so we got engaged. And we got in, I won't tell the long story of it, but we got engaged and, and our communities changed the law in so many different ways, drove down school suspensions and expulsions in some districts to zero, um, and down by 70% across the state between 2010 and roughly 2017. Um, and that was an, an issue that wasn't even on our agenda. That was because we listened to our communities and, and it, we were wrong, we were just wrong. And we learned a lesson that you have to listen to communities and you have to understand that they know, they are closest to the point of pain. Mm -hmm. So they have expertise that you need to understand. Thank you. That is a great segue to the first question I'm gonna to pose to both of you actually. So you're facing a room full of students, faculty, staff who are all passionate about this work that you're doing. What is the role of an institution like Stanford University, Stanford Medicine in particular? You're distinguished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of things. One is uh, the, the front end of Tony's slides were about, you know, the dominant paradigm, which is just wrong and the paradigm that we now know works, right? And it, it takes a lot to particularly, particularly because the institutions that we all grew up in, whether it's Hopkins, Stanford, Penn, like data is king. Right. Right? Like you, 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 you we're, we're taught as medical students, even as, as pre-med students, on rounds, whoever spits out the best data, the latest <laughs> paper, the latest study is like the czar, right? Um, and that person gets the honors, gets to be chief resident, and gets to be department head and tenure, and it all sort of follows from that, from that um, paradigm, right? And to be honest, it's going to sound uncomfortable in this place because I, I, 
I mean, I actually admire this institution enormously. Um, that's some white supremacist colonial shit. <laughs> That's kind of where that comes from, okay? Um, and, and, and philanthropy is not way different, okay? Foundations are not way different, right? And so you have to, in other words, what you have to, what you have to be able to imagine and envision. And if you can do this, then stuff follows, Joyce. Culture follows, practices follow. Mm -hmm. Curriculums follow, tenure follows, all that follows, right? You have to imagine that those young people in Fresno, in the Fresno example, um, either on the school discipline or the parks campaign, when we show up either in philanthropy or as an academic institution, we show up as with the community as an actor in our play. It's our play. Mm -hmm. It's our game. It's our research. It's our data. It's our R01 our, our NIH grant, mm -hmm. okay? And we gotta have community in the picture somewhere, so you know, we, we invite community to show up, but it's on our terms, yeah. right? Which means that a community leader, a grassroots young person in this case, in the case of the Fresno Parks example, um, you view them as, as a supplicant, hmm. as, the receipt, as the receiver of a, of a charitable act. I'm inviting you to this yeah. grant research to participate, right? Mm -hmm. And what we learned in, in building healthy communities is those young people are architects for a different kind of health future. That's right. That's a, that's a very, that's a night and day orientation, yeah. right? And so at a place like Stanford, where, um, and, and I really enjoy my experience at the Haas Center, um, which focuses on, on public service and community service, um, you can begin to see how the machine needs to operate differently if you see those that are most closest and proximate to the point of injustice as architects for a new future rather than as a subject in your, in your research mm -hmm. study. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just different, yeah. right? And what would happen, I mean, think of how, Joyce, think of how tenure would be done differently. Mm -hmm. Think about how, you know, curriculums would be differently organized, right? Um, I'll just say one more thing as, as an example. Um, the, the faculty and educational experience that students, whether they're, they're undergraduate students or graduate students or medical students, if the leaders of the Fresno Parks for All campaign were here as faculty, visiting faculty to engage medical students about the social determinants of health, right? That's different. Right? And so that's the, the direction that we, we, we need to, to think about. It's really a reframing of the whole thing. And, and we talk about educational institutions like Stanford as being about education, research, and service. It's all service. It's all service. And what the equity agenda allows us to do is to bring a racial equity and social justice orientation yeah. to the matter of service. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? Absolutely. Powerful, powerful. One more question. <laughs> One more question from here before I turn it to the audience. I'm sure there are a ton of questions that people are waiting to ask. It's, it's on. And I want to pick up something that you talked about, Dr. Alton. You talked about the power of narratives and that we need to make sure that people are telling their own story. 
can you sort of come with us a little bit in sort of imagining what it would look like if we actually had people telling their own story in incredible institutions like Stanford? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I actually don't even have to imagine it because I've seen it. Um, I'll tell a very quick story, and, and some of you may know it. Some of you may have been part of it. Um, you know, California in 1994 passed Prop 187, uh, which was a proposition that denied access to all state services for undocumented Californians, including school, uh, never mind health care and all other kinds of services. California, 60% of Californians voted in favor of it. And Pete Wilson, the governor-elect at the time, came, did a come-from-behind victory on the backs of Prop 187. And we had our Trump moment in 1994. And that moment galvanized a lot of community organizing, and primarily by undocumented Californians and their allies, who essentially got mobilized and organized and started pushing back against this notion of them as alien. And the story they told was their own story in a way that we saw ourselves in their story. That's a narrative of inclusion. When you change the narrator, let the person who's experiencing the inequity tell their story. And when you hear that story, you recognize all kinds of elements of that story as your own story. Mm -hmm. And you see your shared humanity. Yeah. And you know, fast forward to 2010, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, you know, efforts to include undocumented in full scope Medi-Cal in California, which is now in, in the, the whole undocumented population that's Medi-Cal eligible is included uh, in healthcare. Driver's licenses, um, taking the 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 bar and being able to be a lawyer in California if you're undocumented, taking the medical licensing exam, being able to practice medicine, getting in-state tuition, eligibility for scholarships. All of those things have happened since 1994 due to a change in the narrative about the humanity of our fellow Californians who happen to be undocumented. So th this is happening in yeah. California. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just one story. Uh, there are any number of stories. We're the sort of the anti-Trump here in Cal we, we are. We're just telling a different story about who we are and, and the story of we. And that shapes policy, and policy creates conditions of opportunity. And that's what we've seen yeah. just in that story alone. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. So I lied. I have one more question to follow up on that. <laughs> I promise I'll open it up to you. So on, on that note, give us a picture, a mental picture, what it would look like if California were to realize health equity clearly will be an incredible national example. Although I have to say my old state, Massachusetts, was the first in the nation to introduce universal health care. Just have to say that. Well done. But, <laughs> but what would it look like for California to really achieve health equity? Well, we've actually had this conversation. We have this conversation at the endowment all the time. Um, and you know, my simple answer is that you would see a rewoven social contract. You would see universal health care, you'd see universal child care, you'd see universal paid sick leave, mm -hmm. you'd see access to the ballot, um, you know, which we do have in California, reliable access to the ballot. You would see things like, um, um, you would see the dismantlement of our carceral system and alternatives to incarceration throughout and you know, the end of mass incarceration. You would see policy that reflected the sense of shared solidarity, yeah. that, that people recognize that our fates are inextricably intertwined, we are our brother's keepers, mm -hmm. and that we need to invest in each other and into the future. Mm -hmm. So you could document that. I love that vision. It's incredible. We'll open things up to questions no, here. No more youth prisons. No more youth no prisons. Oh my gosh. Walk. Amen to that. Question here. Ah. Looks like there's a mic over there. Yeah. yeah, maybe if people can line up the two mics so we can line up. Right Hello? Okay. Yes, perfect. <laughs> All right, I guess I'll sit right here. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Hannah Kiani. Um, I moved back here from Baltimore about a year and a half ago. I was also um, at Johns Hopkins. And the focus there on 
community health and population, especially population health in the midst of the pandemic, um, I felt was much more focused than it is. I guess I'm putting Stanford on the spot because I came back and I worked, uh, started working here at Stanford immediately after. And I work here for our patient portal. And here, our patient portal, its name is My Health, and it has 1.3 million users. And you see patient portals like your home at your hometown at Mass General Brigham. They've been able to successfully translate it um, into seven different languages. They have digital access coordinators going through the community to make sure people at different um, levels of comprehension and different backgrounds are able to use the portal. But at Stanford, um, our team is held responsible for um, the amount of usage and enrollment in our app, especially in our ED. Yet, I have an internal political battle at the age of 25 that I think would have been much easier in Baltimore and something that's much closer to a value-based reimbursement system than we are in right now, mm -hmm. to translate this app so that we can not only help mitigate health equity, but stop furthering it in our institution. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know how to stop getting closer. Maybe I'm turning this into a therapy session. But <laughs> um, I'm, I'm feeling fatigued at my age, going against the politics of an institution like this, trying to do what's right. And um, I'm, I'm wondering your take on that, really. Um, yeah. Well, I'm not at Stanford. And so I'll say something quickly and let the Stanfordites uh, no. respond to that. But. Um, <laughs> I think that one of the challenges, and what, what is your name? Hannah. Hannah. And I think one of the challenges is to recognize that you're, you're not alone. This isn't just your That's fight. Right. That's right. Um, and you need to enlist um, community uh, in this fight. Yeah. And that's critical. I, and I, I don't want to say I guarantee you, but I'll say I guarantee you <laughs> that you will get a much more robust response yes. from this institution if you enlist community in this fight. Yeah. Sun Tzu in The Art of War says, when confronting a great enemy, don't go alone. <laughs> ditto, 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 absolutely. Team-based work is what it takes to make changes. Next question. Um, my name is Starla, and I'm actually um, a community member, um, and I work in partnership with Stanford's Office of Community Engagement. Um, I have many years uh, working on the community side, specifically uh, in the realm of uh, health, e health equity. Um, did a lot of my work in Berkeley. Um, over these years, I have seen um, the community that I work in and work for shrink. Um, and that is the story across California, uh, the changing demographics. Um, that is the story across the nation. There's this really big major shift, right? Um, and that is somehow connected to this um, idea of the risk that you were talking about, how some places have the, you know, the, the balance of risk is, you know, really high and not a lot of uh, opportunities. Um, and so sometimes you see these communities change in such a way where there was a lot of risk before. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm out in Oakland, so I'm thinking, Oakland, a lot of risk and a lot of people moving in with a lot of resources and a lot of money who, you know, bumping up against these communities with a lot of risk and, uh, and those communities uh, being kind of decimated and moved on and their risk moving on uh, and shifting. Um, you have people who are working these communities but are also being displaced from these communities. Um, so my question is, um, in light of all these, this shifting and all of this movement um, and the way that people are moving around and the way the resources are moving around, the way the risks are transforming, um, is there an active response? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> great, great question. I like it. Yeah. Kind of dramatic. Um, I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say a couple of things, and, and you might expect that, you know, this is an issue we've grappled with a lot, you know, in our work. And, you know, so I'm, I'm going to give you kind of like the short answer, but, but recognizing that that's a highly nuanced and important question. Um, and so communities change. 
there's no question about it. They're not static. They're dynamic entities. And the, the salient question is, who decides what that change looks like? Is it the people who live in that community, have a stake in that community, have, have grown up, have institutions in that community, have family, have made, invested their lives and, their, and their, their capital and their goodwill in those communities? Or is it some outside forces that have capital? I mean, traditional financial capital. And so in our system as it exists today, there's a narrative that creates policy, that creates conditions. That narrative is that property is sacrosanct. And it's the primary mechanism by which capitalism is exerted in America. It's over the control of property. And in order to undo that narrative, we have to invest in strategies to give communities ownership of land. And that's what we're doing in our work. We call it our inclusive community development work. And that one of the central tenets of that is investing in land trusts, investing in you know, other kinds of arrangements that allow for communities to control land and to manage the way that um, tenants' rights are exercised in those places, to create cultural zones so people see that the communities are for them and reflect their own heritage and culture, um, and to push at the policy level on this issue of essentially housing as a right as opposed to housing as a privilege of wealth. And so that's a, that's a pretty radical attack on traditional American capitalism. I'll, you know, I'll just say it. It's not, it's not something that's well received by the bankers. Um, but at, fundamentally, when you're talking about communities and you're talking about place, you have to create meaningful opportunities for people who live in those places to have control over how those places change and to be able to exercise their stake, their investment uh, in that community. And by the way, um, in California, particularly with African American communities, but with other communities as well, we're following the people. Um, you know, we're following them out into you know Antioch and and into uh, you know the Delta areas in LA. We're following them out into the Inland Empire um, because we feel that equity is really a, around you know the, the people who are having to contend with that risk. So it's a combination of strategies of trying to support the people who are driven out, um, but primarily trying to create conditions in which people have the opportunity to choose to stay if they so choose. Yeah, and this is an example. I'm going to let to get to this next question, Joyce. Um, 10, 12 years ago, by being humble and listening to community in an authentic and deep way, um, we are now in three or four areas of work that 10 years ago, we just weren't in. This is one of them, right? I mean, if you would have said to me, and they did say to me 12 years ago, gentrification is a health issue. I said, no, nah, not really. Let's let the housing people kind of deal with that, right? Um, justice reform. We really weren't, we were very, we were scantily into justice reform. Um, school discipline is another issue. Economic exclusion. You say, well, listen, you know, we're a health foundation. We can't just try and solve poverty, too. We're not doing economic exclusion. Now, now we, we kind of are. I mean, it, it makes it difficult because our resources, even our resources, are limited, and you can't spread yourself into a thousand different issues. Uh, but this, you're bringing up an area where we heard hand over fist from communities just about everywhere that gentrification is, is a wellness issue for our community. So... very much. Next question, please. I had to write it down so I didn't forget and change my topic. Um, you mentioned, my name is Christine Von Reisel. I'm a patient advocate, but I'm also a Medicare patient for the last 20 years. I collect a lot of data and generate a lot of data. So you mentioned that data is king, and I like to, I advocate on the other side of industry, um, of the pharmaceutical and healthcare. And the data is a big deal there. I like to tell people that I think if we equate data to the music industry, then in that sense, my data becomes my song. And so when I look at the economics of this and the model of healthcare and how it works, where do you see data? And do you think a collective, um, 
I don't know, education and awareness to the general community around the value of collective data could shift the model of healthcare? I'll take a piece of it. I, you know, I, I think, and don't get me wrong, don't get us wrong, um, data is, is still critical. What we have found and what we learned, if I'll leave you with this aphorism, you know, when, when confronting the enemy, when trying to move an agenda, no data without, no, no, no numbers without stories and no stories without numbers. I right. work with a nonprofit, and our right. saying is no aggregation without representation. There you go. <laughs> you sound like Jesse Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> I should say it a different way then. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so when, when um, it was a beautiful marriage, back to the school suspension story, because we were hearing the stories from the young people, right? And they probably had maybe some data, some limited data, but we, we invested in a, in, a, in a data infrastructure to support their story. And they got really good, when it, because at some point they had to show up at, at um, school board hearings and, and, and in the legislature. Um, remember we had that great day at the, at the Capitol with Common? Common, the rapper activist, came and, you know, with the young people and, and told, the, and, and, and they got really, proficient at not only telling their own story, but you know, in a data construct, right? So um, yeah, you gotta marry the, the, the stories with the data, you gotta marry the narrative uh, with the data. And, and, and the reason why, it, it's not guaranteed that you'll win. The reason why that's a better approach is you, know, you gotta think about a particular either school board member or a legislature or a legislator you know, the ones who are, are just like against, like if they're like Trump, you're not going to win them, yeah. right? Then there are people who are sort of in your corner and you kind of got them already. So you're going for the people that are in the cusp. And some of the people on the, on the cusp are motivated by story and narrative. Others better so by the data and the numbers. But you got to get the heart and you got to get the head, right? And so that's, you probably know that already. I'm just affirming what you're saying. But, yeah. but it's a way of saying to you, um, do you have the kind of community and storytelling and narrative support to we've complement the, the, the data story that you want to tell? We've got a, a lot of it, but we're still working. So, Thank you for the question. That was excellent. Thank you. Other questions? I'm getting the sign that we're getting close to time. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, I want to thank you. Okay, La last question. <laughs> do, do you want to use the mic, please, so everybody can hear you? <laughs> Here we go. Hi, oh, this has been a wonderful afternoon and looking forward to the rest of the evening. Um, my name's Elizabeth and California native. And just in looking at gentrification, uh, what's driving it now more isn't just rich people coming in and buying up things. It's rich people and living in these houses. The real problem now is they're just leaving these houses on, you know, just empty. And this is a worldwide phenomenon right now of depriving billions of people of safety and security and health through these invest, you know, different investment schemes. And so, you know, just looking at this bigger picture of dispossession throughout the world. So just a little note. Yeah, yeah and, and that's a great point. And there's some policy now in various places to actually tax vacant buildings. And yes, and to put that money towards homelessness. Um, so so again, that, that requires a kind of you know community support to sort of drive these kind of policy changes. San Francisco, I believe, has just passed something like that or is contemplating it. Um, but yes, that's uh, it, it's true. Cap the way capitalism works, that's OK, you know? Because property rights are sacrosanct. Um, we have to change our understanding of what's OK. Excellent. And I'm going to give the last word to our distinguished 
visitor. It better be a distinguished center. word. <laughs> no pressure. Um, well, just to thank you. Um, thank you. Each and every one of you are here because you're part of this battle. Um, and, and, you know, make no mistake about it, we know this, the odds are against you. Whatever you're trying to do, wherever you're trying to do it, the deck is stacked against you, right? There is no logical way to assume that you will win the battle you're in. But we've seen it happen. <clears throat> um, organizing, activism, voice, power, durability, consistency, stay at the fight, um, get allies, and uh, you're doing God's work. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. I.N., Dr. Saki, Dr. Ross, for that wonderful presentation and the amazing inform and informative Q&A session. Um, we're very thankful for your presence here today, and I think one of my favorite and parts... And you're a first-year medical student? I am. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step on your closing here. Um, my mic is off. So one, one of the other key lessons that, that we learned, um, and we implied it in the presentation, but I want, I want to make it explicit. Because racial equity is important, place is important, power is important. If you are not diligently and assertively engaging young people in these fights, you will not win that fight, okay? And as Tony likes to say, if you go back to the civil rights movement, the farm workers movement, LGBTQ movement, women's rights, those leaders in those fights, when the fights are really unpopular, are young people. Martin Luther King, John Lewis, Dolores Huerta, Marion Wright Edelman, Cesar Chavez, they started those fights in their 20s, okay? And at the height, when Martin Luther King was leading the civil rights movement at the age of 33 or whatever he was, okay, his popularity rating at the height of the civil rights movement among white Americans, his disapproval rating was 71%. His disapproval rating among black people was 50%. It is young people that are gonna change this nation and fix this mess that my generation left behind, okay? And so I say that because when I was a first year medical student, there's no way I would have thought I've even had the time to come here and be in front of a place like that. But I had my head buried in my, the pharmacology text or whatever the heck I was studying at the time. So a round of appreciation for this first year medical student who's involved with this. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Now you can finish. <laughs> no, thank you again. I think one of my favorite parts from the Q&A session was the whole we aren't alone in this fight. I think the fact that this room is filled with so many people who are dedicated to community health, dedicated to health equity, really exemplifies that point. So thank you again. If we can give a round of applause one more time for them. Okay, so in the interest of time, while people are trickling in, I think we're going to go ahead and get started with our um, panel discussion. So now I would just like to invite up the great Dr. Chen, who is the executive director for the Office of, Di for the Office of Community Engagement. Thank you, Adele. Um, since people are still trickling in, um, I'll just say I'm Wei Ting Chen. I'm the I'm executive director of the Office of Community Engagement at Stanford Medicine. And once again, welcome all of you to the 21st Community Health Symposium. And at this point, by this point, I think it's also known as the informal Hopkins alumni meetup. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm gonna write to them and say, I think everybody at Stanford got the magazine last this week. Um, so um, I would like to go ahead and introduce our panelists, and um, I'm just going to put in some cue to have our folks come in from outside. Um, 
I, um, I will start with our first um, um, panelist uh, alphabetically, Dr. Belinda Hernandez Arriaga. Um, she is the founder and executive director of ALAS. She holds a doctorate in education and a master's degree in social work. She is a licensed clinical social worker registered with California Board of Behavior Sciences. She's an, also an assistant professor at the University of San Francisco, teaching the counseling psychology program. Her focus of expertise is mental health with the Latino community, understanding trauma in immigrant children and families, and working with farm workers and their mental, on their mental health. She had launched significant community mental health initiatives at ALAS, including significant advocacy for systemic change in care and access for our COSITE program. Belinda was named to the San Mateo County Women's Hall of Fame and was appointed a San Mateo County District 3 Arts Commissioner. She's the author of the award-winning children's book, Love and Monsters in Sophia's Life. She has been a longtime member of the Bay Area Border Relief. And if you can hear from Belinda's bio, she doesn't have one career. She has three careers, and it sounds like she has three careers concurrently. And that is a theme that we're going to hear repeatedly in the um, panelists' um, bios. Next, Lisa Teeler. Lisa, would you like to say hi? Um, Lisa Teeler serves as the executive director of the Bay Area Community Health Advisory Council, a community health-based organization focused on eliminating health disparities in diverse communities across generations in San Mateo County. The Health Advisory Council has an inclusive approach to this work by partnering with several organizations through health education, connection to resources, and advocacy. Prior to this role, Lisa spent 30 plus years in the biotech industry in technical and management roles, supporting clinical trials and manufacturing processes and in human resources roles, specifically managing a right, wide range of diversity, inclusion, and equity initiatives. She continues to consult in the diversity, inclusion, and equity space with J. Maddox & Associates, a consulting firm that offers customized service, services and expertise in partner, to partner with organizations in creating inclusive, equitable, and diverse workplaces. Lisa also serves as a community advisory board member for the UCSF Helen Dilla Family Comprehensive Cancer Center and COVID-19 Research, UCSF Wisdom Study, Sequoia Hospital, and the Stanford Cancer Institute. And next we'll have Christine Tyler, which I had to just wave. <laughs> Christine Tyler is an assistant nurse manager nurse for the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. Prior to this position, she worked for the county as the manager of utilization management, case management, and the authorization center for Valley Health Plan, and as the director of special projects for ambulatory administration. Like I said, a lot of careers. Prior to employment with the uh, Valley Homeless Health Care Plan, she was the director of policy and clinical activities for Community Health Partnership, a consortium of nine nonprofit community health center organizations, the city of San Jose, and the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. She has 38 years of direct and indirect healthcare experience in pediatric and emergency nursing, health education, personnel and program management, and health policy and advocacy. Originally from Peoria, Illinois, and I'm so sorry if I butchered that name, Christine received a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from Bradley University and a Master's in Public Health from the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque. She's also a graduate of the California Healthcare Foundation Leadership Fellowship Program. And next we have Dr. Sandy Winters, she, who is the executive director of, the, of Senior Co-Siders in Half Moon Bay, a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting successful aging for all older adults living on the San Mateo County coast. Sandy was born and raised in Zimbabwe, then moved to Cape Town, South Africa, where she was a successful entrepreneur. In 2003, Sandy moved in Lexington, Kentucky with her family. She completed a Master's of Health Administration and a PhD in Public Administration at the University of Kentucky. In 2009, Sandy came to California and completed a postdoctoral fellowship under the mentorship of Dr. Abby King in the Stanford Prevention Research Center. Sandy worked at SPRC for 10 years in a variety of positions that included the Be Well program, a partnership with the Qassam University in Saudi Arabia, and as a director of the Stanford Well for Life study. Last but not least, our moderator, Dr. Baldeep Singh. Dr. Singh is a clinical professor at Stanford School of Medicine and is the new medical director of Samaritan House. We used to work with Dr. Jason Wong, so we may have to talk. 
Um, following residency at UCLA, Dr. Singh spent two years in the National Health Service Corps in, in the Northeast Los Angeles Clinic, primarily serving underserved and vulnerable populations before to, returning to UCLA to join the faculty. At UCLA, he served as the Associate Program Director for the Internal Medicine Program. He was a direct, medical director of one of the faculty practices and also led the resident ambulatory continued clinic of UCLA and Venice Family Clinic, which is one of the largest free clinics in the country. In 2009, he then moved to the Bay Area to be closer with family and became the clinical chief of Stanford Internal Medicine, as well as the director of the Stanford Internal Medicine Resident Outpatient Con Continuity Clinic. He was recently a board member at Mayview Healthcare Health Center in Mountain View and is the co-director of the Pacific Free Clinic at Stanford. His career, as you can tell, has focused on underserved care, global health, healthcare delivery, and medical education. And with that, please join me in welcoming our panel. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? <clears throat> so uh, I think I uh, wanted to pick up on a couple of themes that have been uh, expressed in uh, some of the amazing uh, talks earlier today, and, and I think what we see here today is the people who are actually living some of this that with, through their careers, um, the amazing work towards health equity in each of the varying areas that we see on the stage. Um, so I think I'd start by having each of you talk for just a few minutes, I know we have limited time here, but uh, a little bit about your area and how um, you see some of the successes in your own area in health equity over the last many years. In order, Lisa. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for this opportunity to be here today. Um, thank you for sticking around uh, for the rest of the program to hear what we have to say. Um, Bayer Community Health Advisory Council was started um, in 1995, and it was basically a group of African Americans in San Mateo County that saw the community assessment needs report and saw that African Americans were at the top of the list for everything that's not good for us. So cardiovascular disease, cancer, smoking, et cetera. Um, and they decided that they wanted to do something about it. Um, so at that time, they partnered with a neighboring healthcare organization to really start bringing the information to the community in a culturally competent way around some of those conditions. And the organization has continued to partner with a variety of organizations, CBOs, healthcare organizations, um, the community, faith-based leaders, educators, et cetera, to really dive into the issues that are, are concerned from the community. And I think you've heard that theme, that uh, listening to the community, the community will tell you what they need, and they'll tell you how to do it. But you gotta listen, and you gotta actually do it. Um, and so um, on this journey, uh, when I saw the question about journey to health equity, I thought about the African pro proverb that is, if you want to go um, fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, you have to go together. And that's really what it's about. It's going to take each and every one of us to address um, health equity to move it along. Um, and that you know, when one um, is helping someone else, you help everyone, including yourself. Um, and I think that is sort of the theme that we heard today, and that's the theme that, that has permeated our organization it continues to permeate our organization. And we saw that a lot with the, the pandemic. We didn't really have time um, to argue with folks. It's like, we, we need to work together, because people are literally dying. And so that's what we've been doing, and that's what we'll continue to do for the next 20 some years. Good evening, everybody. Um, like they said in the bio, I'm, my name's Christine Tyler and I work with the County of Santa Clara's Homeless Healthcare Program. We take obviously this very seriously because many of our patients, most of our patients have had childhood trauma, have substance use disorder, mental illness, have suffered various isms through the course of their lives. We have a transgender program, we work with farm workers. So this is very near and dear to our heart. We wanna make our place a safe space to that end, once DEI became more known, we created our own, well, I'm in a larger system, obviously, with the County of Santa Clara, and they, the Valley Medical Center has its own DEI committee. 
there's also an office of DEI and a chief officer of DEI. But because the homeless program, we're so our own thing, we have created our own DEI committee. We also, in addition to the mandatory training that the county has, we've also arranged to have a, a specialist whose area of expertise is DEI come to us from Oregon and give us a half day training. So it's important to us, we want to make our clinic a safe space for all. Um, everyone's deeply committed to it. Uh, we, in, when we interview, one of the questions we ask is, how have you benefited from privilege? So we ask that question. We also, every time we hire a provider, we're looking at, at it under the lens of DEI. Uh, we want to diversify our workforce. That's always a challenge when healthcare providers are hard enough to find, particularly um, persons of color, particularly psychiatry and mental health mm -hmm. providers. But we have a relatively diverse workforce, and we're continuing to try to diver diversify <laughs> and hire for that. But sometimes you have to go against, okay, you want to have a diverse person, but how long are you going to wait to get that particular entity or that particular language when you've got people suffering and we need to get the care to the people. So that's mine. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Sandy Winter, and thank you again for having us here, for staying. Um, and what an amazing panel. I feel very privileged to be here talking with, with these wonderful colleagues. So um, I run a senior center, and I think that there is, um, just to put in, to context, currently in the US, 10,000 people every day turn 65. It is a growth industry. There are currently about one in five people are older adults, and soon it's going to be one in four. We've already reached the state in the US where there are now more older adults than there are children under 18. So when you think about how we allocate our resources and our time and our energy and how we set up our policies and our systems, it's very important to try to do that with an older adult focus. So, um, you know, part of, of equity is including that everybody, is ensuring that everybody is included in these conversations. And I think there is a lot of ageism in the world, uh, you know, not appreciating the value and the benefit that older adults bring. And I think we saw that particularly during COVID when, you know, the, the, there was a lot of blaming of older adults that it was, you know, they, they were the older, the people who were suffering the most. And instead of drawing alongside them, somehow they were made into, into victims. So um, we provide programs and services that support all older adults on the coast. Um, we are, our programs are not income dependent, they're age dependent, and we like to make sure that we offer something that um, can be enjoyed by everybody in our community. One of the, the things that we did in January last year is we have a surprisingly large number of older adults living in the housing campus in which our programs and services are offered. And these are Chinese um, uh, people who don't speak any English, who have no family here, who generally have very low levels of income, and they were completely isolated from the programs and the services that we provide and that other organizations on the coast provide. And we felt it was really important to give them a voice, and um, so we hired a part-time Mandarin and Cantonese speaker to act as our community liaison. And we, we were very glad to have her, but very sad that one of the biggest contributions she's made so far to our organization is being very involved in the tragic shooting that happened in Half Moon Bay uh, on January the 23rd. There was a, a small group of the farm workers who were Chinese. And I think often when people think about farm workers, they think about Latinos. They're not necessarily thinking about the Chinese community. And so we were able to send our community liaison right from the very beginning and still to this day, she's been working a lot with the Chinese farm workers who, and their families and the survivors who were affected on that terrible day. So um, I feel that that was a, 
It was a fortunate move, and I like to say it was somewhat strategic, but when I think about all the other language diversities that we have in San Mateo County, San Mateo County is the most diverse county in the whole of California. There are so many different languages spoken here. And as, you know, as a small nonprofit or as a government entity, how do we make sure that people can access the important services and programs that they need that are in the languages that they speak, that are um, at the right education level? And I don't think that one organization or one entity can do that all by itself. And so I want to talk about Lisa's point is that if you want to go far, you have to go with others. Mm -hmm. And so how can we partner strategically with academic organizations and with other nonprofits and government organizations to do that? Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It's nice to be here with you all today. My name is Belinda Hernandez Arriaga, and I am the founder of ALAS. And I will say that ALAS began with zero. Um, we didn't have a grant. We didn't really have a plan at the time, but we had a dream. And one of the things, I just came back from a retreat with the Latino Community Foundation, and they were like, what is the heart of your story? And when we whittled it down, what we were saying is that we kept waiting for someone to come and start these programs. We kept waiting for who was going to be there in our community on the coast side for a primarily immigrant community, right? And so um, as a licensed clinician, I was doing pro bono mental health while I worked at the county of Santa Clara. And we just kept waiting through the different silos of what we would hear of all the injustices and, and actually children getting very sick. Coming to Stanford was one of my first cases of a little girl that <laughs> kept getting sick and kept getting sick from stomach pains and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. And it wasn't until she made it to Stanford and they did a battery of tests and said, she's perfectly healthy, but the pain is you know, emotional. We need her to get evaluated and checked and, and supported. And it wasn't until three months into our own treatment that she drew for me a picture of a mama cat and a baby cat with tears streaming down their faces. And she X'd out the mama cat. And on the top, she put no papers. And on the baby cat, she put papers. And that began the story of realizing the immigration trauma that so many have, the fears. And we work with farm workers. We work with children. We work with families on the coast side. Uh, regardless of um, language or uh, ethnicity, we're primarily Latino, but we've been working with all farm workers and um, children, families, and we provide education and the arts. We believe that that's a pathway to mental health and uh, cultural identity and the lack of being able to immerse themselves in culture is also affecting health. And I can talk more about that later. Thank you. Such uh, really inspiring stories and, and careers. Um, I was thinking a little bit about what Dr. Ross said earlier about <clears throat> the younger generation. Uh, you have a lot of the younger generation here today, the, the future leaders uh, at Stanford. Being here for the last 13 years, I will say that uh, Stanford uh, was not as that involved in, in, uh, in the community and has come some distance but still has a long distance to engage with communities and organizations like yours and to do a better job. And I think most of that um, energy has come from the, from the young students. So I applaud the students and I encourage you to continue to push your administrators to, uh, to push uh, Stanford forward. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if each of you could give uh, some guidance to the young people today uh, in the audience about, they all want to make a change, they all want to make a difference. That's why they came to a place that with big ambitions. Uh, given your backgrounds and uh, careers, what would you say to young people today about trying to move the, the work that you've done forward and, and move the progress that we've heard about today forward? Um, first of all, pace yourself. Um, I've been doing this work and each job kind of built on the other because I wanted to get back when I first started. I wanted to see single payer. I wanted to see universal health care. I wanted to see no health disparities. And I've been doing this now for 39 years. And sometimes I feel like I'm just treading water. Or I'm like on a treadmill, and I'm getting further and further back. And then Trump becomes president. And I'm like, oh my god. So I'm telling you all, pace yourself, take breaks, take vacations, find your community, find your tribe, 
rely on them, hold on to them, and just try not to let the negatives get you down. Because I've been up and down in my career, and it, it can get disheartening. It can get sad, because you know I was a young, bright-eyed student, and now I'm a 60-year-old lady who's coming on the end of her career. But I feel like I didn't get anywhere. So take your vacation, love your family, you know, be diverse, do lots of different things with your life because this is, we're in this for the long haul and it's going to be a long fight. Um, I keep saying somebody's got to make me dictator and then I'll fix everything, but it hasn't <laughs> happened. So anyway, I feel very strongly about this and every time I talk to students, I feel my passion rise because you give me energy to continue to fight the fight. So thank you. Amen. I well, I tell my students all the time, and I really mean this so, um, with so much energy, that if you have a dream, you see a gap, you see a need, you can make that change. And I'm testimony to that because I never, ever dreamt about having a nonprofit. That was the furthest thing from my mind. Um, but we saw that, again, you know, we were waiting, and we couldn't keep waiting. And I think that's the answer, is that you are the change. I loved what he said that, um, you know, it's the young people. It's every, every one of you in this room contribute every day to change. But truly, you can make a big difference. And I've seen it in Alas after 10 years. It started from zero, and we've grown so much to having the first ever mental health double-decker equity bus. Uh, check it out, Equity Express. We just literally came from Pajaro right now here where we delivered supplies. And it's a dream built by Life Science Cares, Genentech, um, Gilead. It's something that was inspired by us thinking, how do we take the service to the farms? We were thinking a bus, a school bus maybe, a used van. And we started partnering with Genentech. They were like, no, let's dream the double-decker bus that takes tech workers out. We'll refurbish it and make it anew. It's on allisdreams.com. You can see it there. We have a whole cultural center that's full of color. It doesn't look like a sterile counseling room. It's with Frida and Hearts and Coco, Coco Room for play therapy. Um, we have the Sueño Center. We have a yellow house with a pink door. I mean, I think you have to make your dream and say, we're going to flip systems. And that's what I'm saying. We're trying to flip systems of care. Um, luckily, we have Stanford partners that are there with us, Annie, Baron, here in the room. But even with Annie, um, they're saying, yeah, like, how do we come along and create new pathways of care? And that starts with all of you. So if you dream it, be motivated, you can do it. And as you all said, people together, I've had so much, it's not just me. I've had so many people, our city of Half Moon Bay is here, Jalisa, uh, county folks, Stanford folks, university, philanthropy. So you know what? Uh, when one door closes, find another door, find another person. They're there. Just don't give up. Well, first of all, I want to tell the young folks, you are enough. That's for mm -hmm. straight up. So that starting from that, once you decide, I am enough, and so whatever you decide to do, and sometimes you'll try something and you're like, hmm, that, that's not my jam. That's a data point. So then you move on to the next thing. You say, OK, maybe I want to try this. And allow your, yourself to explore all that, because that's how you get to know what, what, what rocks your skull, right? And, and um, don't let anybody tip. Uh, my dad told me, God rest his soul, don't let anybody take your joy. Because there's going to be some folks out there, particularly if, you're, if you know you're enough, and you know you're trying to find your, you know, your jam, trying to find your tribe, trying to find whatever you want to do. There'll be people out there like, why is she so happy? Why is she so content? Why does she get along with folks? Why does she want to do this? You don't want to be around them kind of people. <laughs> you know, misery loves company. Well, you know what? Misery needs to stay right over there because I'm going to go this direction. <laughs> I mean, re seriously. And, and there will be people that will tell you no. You're like, Thank you very much. You can be respectful. And you say, thank you very much, and you move on. And you move on to the next thing and the next thing. So what, whatever it is that you try to do, where it's health, if you see Dr. I Icon, he's the he attorney. I mean, you know, whatever it is that you want to do, that's enough. And that's, that's my advice. I would echo that. Um, I 
echo uh, a lot of what has already been said. For me, I think it's important to do something that makes you happy, which is exactly mm. what Lisa's saying. You know, you spend an inordinate amount of your time at work. So if you hate it, don't be there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, the, the other thing that I have told my students in the past is, how do you eat an elephant? one bite at a time. You know, sometimes things can seem so overwhelming, and obviously we don't eat elephants, but it's an analogy, right? So just break <laughs> things down. In <laughs> my favorite animal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to, when things feel overwhelming, what, what is it that you can do in the moment um, to make a difference? And partnership, partnership, partnership. Uh, we're uh, maybe coming to the end, but I, maybe I thought it, uh, we could open it up for some questions from the audience before we close today. Um, you have a huge brain trust of energy and excitement and, and experience in, in trying to tackle all the challenges of, uh, of health equity uh, over many decades here. So I'd love for people to come up and maybe ask a few questions before we close today. So question for all four of you. How do you engage community partners who maybe aren't willing to give the same amount of work that you're willing to do so that you don't end up with projects that you've taken over completely? How do you really build those, those important like partnerships? That, um, you know, everybody has value. And there are some partners that can give at different levels, and you have to respect that and and get that straight from the very beginning. Like, hey, this partner can do X, this partner can do something else, and then we all kind of, you know, put your put your ingredients into the into the recipe. Um, and, and you know, there are some partners that maybe just aren't ready, and you can be honest about that and, and say, hey, you know, maybe they're not ready or they need something else. And, and you can, again, leave it there and, and, and move on. Um, the challenge is when you have made the agreement and then you go down the road and there's an there's a, a, a issue arises. Again, I'm all for cards on the table, transparency. Let's have an open, honest conversation about what's working and what's not. And because you never want, to me, you never want to burn that bridge because we're all trying to do the work, right? And some of us can do it, some of us do it differently, some of us can do it maybe down the road or later. Um, so, you know, just be, just be honest and see if there's a way we can work things out and, and because it's gonna happen. I mean, there are gonna be times, or people have the best intentions, like, wow, I really wanna, you know, volunteer, or I wanna do whatever, and they just, you know, for, something happens in their life, and, you know, you have to just respect that and, again, move on. I think I would refer back to something that um, Dr. Ross said about um, making community partnerships on your terms or on your community partners' terms. I think that's really important. So if you're doing it from you know, honoring and respecting the community partner, then what are the win-win situations that, we that you can come up with? And what are the low-hanging fruits? And what are the things that need to be deferred to another point in time? But you can't approach community from your perspective. It has to be from the community's perspective. <laughs> And I think relationships is really important to build a strong relationship before you enter into the partnership, or at least know if your values align with their values. Because if that doesn't really align or they don't have the same like mission um, or investment in the work, or maybe don't even have the same goal, then it makes it hard for them to kind of come up with you. So I think it's so important, and it's okay if you don't, you know, aren't a good fit for another community partnership, it's, that's okay. I think it's important that you work good together by having relationship. Do we have time for one more question before we end? Maybe one more. <clears throat> so one thing we've seen after like the horrific, horrific murder of George Floyd was a lot of companies and a lot of universities trying to invest in DEI, in which you're seeing a lot of people being appointed as chief of DEI, and we're having a lot of departments devoted to it. But then we've started seeing that a lot of these departments are actually fizzled out. A lot of people who had these positions 
have unfortunately lost those positions. So what would you give as advice for people who are taking on these roles in the context of DEI, especially during this current landscape? I'll address that since I worked for a corporate and was focused on DEI. Um, embedding it into the business so that everybody sees the value and then everyone is accountable. So it's not just the DEI department that's doing DEI work. Yes. Everybody's doing DEI work. Um, because you can get burned out really quickly if you're the person that's the quote unquote DEI person and everybody thinks you're like going to save the day. And you know, one, two, three, four, or five department, uh, person department is going to cut it. Everybody has to be committed. Everybody has to have it embedded. And, it's, and they need to be accountable and measurable. And that's really the bottom line. And, and, and you know, of course we do DEI work because it's important and it's the right thing to do. But it's also the business thing to do, right? And you show that value, people are like, because when I first started, the commercial, when I worked in corporate, the commercial people got it real quick. Because they saw, wow, that means we could sell our therapeutics to communities that we haven't really been serving that need it. So they, you know, other departments, not so much. But, and then also speaking in their terms, right? When I talked to the CFO, it was, you know, risk management and bottom line numbers. When I talked to the research f folks, it was about exploration and, you know, so then like, people get it because you're talking, you know, you're talking things that they understand. So that's my two cents. I would say it's more than just talking the talk, it's walking the walk. Yep. Make yourself relevant, make it embedded into your organization, and like she said, show the statistics. Get rid of our inequities in health and in education and all that. Show how important this is and how vital this is to our existence as a community and as a people, because it is. I think I would say it goes back to the relationship building that um, Belinda was talking about. And what um, Dr. Eiton said is that it's putting the huma human face on everything. This is about people, people like you, like me. You know, if, if, you, if you tell the story, live your values, um, and have strong relationships, I think that's a way to embed it within your culture. Yeah, I, I got invited often to do DEI talks, but what I started to see, it felt like it was very plastic, like it was just a selling point, right, to make sure that you could check off the box that you were doing this work. And so I think that's what people started to realize, like, wait, this is not really, you know, as genuine as we would want to see it. And so I, I, I'm going to give an example. I don't know if this is the right answer, but it stuck with me. I went into Bill.com, like, several times, um, for, for, for a presentation, actually, on farm workers. Imagine, farm worker, uh, whole presentation at bill.com, right? So we go in, and when you see on the wall, like right when you come in, they have their values. But one of their values is be humble. And another one is like be your authentic self. You know, um, and just the values that they have was so much about being you and honoring you. And as you honor yourself, we honor each other. But it was like, you couldn't miss it, and then they had it on the wall in like, like huge letters. So their whole, you didn't even have to talk it. It was like, this is what we believe in. This is who we are. And I think too much about what we believe in, what we, who we are, we don't pass it down into our org, so it just stays in a cubicle or stays in a department or stays in a position. Um, but I think we need to like realize like how do we embrace those values from the very beginning from from the moment someone walks through that door you know and how do we keep that going permanently so yeah well, I want to um, thank our speakers today for a wonderful panel discussion and uh, <laughs> give them a round of applause um, I'll just end with a little piece of advice for the young people which is you know um, Put a North Star for yourself, something that you think you want to strive for, and then spend the next, all of your career pushing towards that star, because uh, that's what it will take in most cases. So, so don't, never lose track of your North Star. Thank you very much. I love that. Thank you again to our wonderful panelists today. 
I think um, I really liked Dr. Tyler's comment about it's important to remember to pace ourselves. I think that's really reflected in the title of today's event. It's a journey towards health equity. It's on a race towards health equity. So thank you again to our um, panelists. And now we will move on to the award ceremony portion of the event um, where, we, we, where we will be awarding um, great community leaders that have been doing great work and very crucial work in the community that shows their commitment to, to the people around them. So with that said, I would like to present the first award, which will be the Outstanding Community Partner Award. Um, the Outstanding Community Partner Award recognizes and honors the vital role and commitment of our community partners in supporting Stanford Medicine's pursuit of excellence in education and community service. The recipients of this award shows, show exceptional ability to address community needs and promote health equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, today we will have two recipients, and the first recipient I am pleased to announce is Ayudando Latinos a Soñar, also known as ALAS, for their commitment to the community and also their instrumental role that they played in supporting and providing. <laughs> 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 Great round of applause. Um, but also their, um, the role that they played in supporting the community after the Half Moon Bay shooting. So um, accepting this award will be Dr. Belinda Hernandez Arriaga. So if you can come up. Okay, thank you so much for the work that you've done in your community. Um, the next award will go to the Special Olympics Northern California. <laughs> and accepting this award on the organization's behalf is Justin Steinberg. Got to turn it. This is Alas. One more. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> and Special Olympics Northern California. <laughs> okay, perfect. So next, I will be presenting the Community Engaged Faculty Award. The Community Engaged Faculty Award is given to two faculty members who exemplify leadership in advancing students, staff, and community in learning conduct community-based research, foster reciprocal community partnerships, and build institutional commitments to service learning and civic engagement. This year's first Community Engaged Faculty Award goes to Dr. Tamara Montague, I remembered this time. And, and accepting the award on her behalf will be Anuska Sonyal. And the second Community Engaged Faculty Award goes to Dr. Holly Tabor. Next, we will be presenting the Rhonda McClinton Brown Community Engaged Leader Award. The Rhonda McClinton Brown Community Engaged Leader Award recognizes a staff leader or mentor at Stanford University that has worked towards a vision of service, supported faculty and students, and formed exemplary community engaged partnerships. 
This year's Rhonda McClinton Brown Community Engaged Leader Award goes to Michelle Jimenez. And, it's, and accepting the award on Michelle Jimenez's behalf is Caroline Murtaugh. Now I will invite up Jennifer Torai to present our most newest award. anyone. I'm very short, so I'm going to stand over here. <sighs> Lori Campos Collier made it a mission to fight for more equitable and accessible health care services for all. For 14 years, she led Stanford HealthCare's government affairs work, providing direction for activities related to legislative, regulatory, and public policy issues at the local, state, and federal levels. She worked closely with business organizations and industry leadership groups to further Stanford HealthCare's strategic goals while keeping our patients in our community as the utmost priority. Excuse me. Throughout her career, She battled cancer four times, and she was a trained patient advocate with the National Cancer Institute. She also served as a member of the Stanford Cancer Institute Community Advisory Board, the National Cancer Institute's Cancer Moonshot Biobanking External Scientific Panel, the American Society of Clinical Oncologists Moore Grant Technical Expert Panel, and the National Cancer Institute's Geographic Management of Health Disparities Program, which included the states of Washington, Oregon, California, Alaska, American Samoa, and Guam. Her involvement in all of these groups, while also dealing with her own health issues, is a reflection of the breadth of her heart and her passion for helping others receive the care and support they deserve. While her LinkedIn profile can tell you about all of the wonderful things she did professionally, it would not give you a sense of what a kind, caring, and thoughtful person she was. She cared so deeply about others that even during her most challenging times, she still put the needs of her community ahead of her own. In Lori's office, you would have seen a quote from Vincent Van Gogh, which I believe captures the way she felt about her work. It says, your profession is not what you bring, uh, sorry. <laughs> your profession is not what brings home your paycheck. Your profession is what you were put on earth to do with such passion and such intensity that it becomes spiritual in calling. This award is being given to Lori posthumously today as a way to recognize who she was as a person and the incredible work she accomplished throughout her life as an advocate for community health. Her husband, Steve, is here to receive the award on her behalf. And in future years, we plan to grant this award to individuals from the community who demonstrate the same passion and intensity in advocacy for community health the way that Lori did. Thank you everyone. This has just been such an inspirational event. 
a fantastic day, and I just feel ready to go out and change the world today. So I'm, I'm excited, and I don't know how to work this thing, but I don't think I have any slides, so we're good to go. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone, really, for being here this evening, for staying past our allotted time, but I think it was just so worth it, so thank you for being here for our 21st annual Community Health Symposium. So I'm Magali Fostioto. I'm Associate Dean in our Stanford Medicine Office of Faculty Development and Diversity. Um, as we are sort of coming out of the recent pandemic, we've really been especially appreciative of this opportunity to really be in community with all of you here today. This has just really filled my soul, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, many of us have attended previous community health symposia, and it's a great opportunity to catch up with our colleagues and to learn from our amazing speakers and our community partners about our collective journey towards health equity. So I'd like to just thank our amazing speakers today, first from the California Endowment, Dr. Ross and Dr. Eiten. They were wonderful, um, especially as well our, our two moderators today, Dr. Dr. Singh and Dr. Saki. And I would also like to thank our panelists who represent really the incredible organizations that have shared their stories with us. Um, Dr. Belinda Hernandez Arriaga, Lisa Teeler, Christine Tyler, and Dr. Sandy Winter. We would be remiss in not thanking the amazing team that flawlessly organized the event today. Um, our two hosts of the event, the Office of Community Engagement and the Health Equity Action Leadership Network of our Office of Faculty Development and Diversity collaborated to plan today's session. I'm led by Glenda Estioko in the Office of Community Engagement with support from Stanford Haas's Center for Public Service and our medical student leaders Edo Igodaro, <laughs> as well as Ada Zhang, who I do not believe could be here today, but participated a lot in our planning as well. And we would actually want to really thank our tech team who has recorded the event and really helped everything go so well today. So collectively, we've learned really a great deal this evening about the journey towards health equity, where we've been, where we're headed, and how we can partner to ensure that the journey to health equity supports all members of our community. We are looking forward to seeing you again at next year's 22nd annual Community Health Symposium. Please enjoy your friends and colleagues in the lobby for some refreshments. Thank you again. <laughs>